So we welcome Glenn Olson as part of our Explore Tech Engineering series here at the Marshall Lyon County Library. Welcome, Glenn. Yeah, thank you, and welcome to the people that came. And we're going to do the presentation so that we can, uh, anyone who wants to, to, to watch it can go on TV and watch the presentation as well. You can see that this presentation is for the engineering project development process. And we'll go through what, what we do uh, for the development of any of our civil projects. You can see this list of items. And this is a list of project uh, timelines. And all of these things we do before a project even begins. So it starts with either a petition or a request for a project. Then it goes to an agreement uh, of assessment and waiver uh, or waivers of irregularity of agreement for that. Then we have a resolution ordering the preparation of the report by the city council. We then uh, take that project to Marshall Municipal Utilities. And if it's a joint construction project that MMU has some financial interest in that they're going to help pay for it, they actually do an authorization um, for us to go ahead with the project development. Then we receive the report at the council again, all of the items up there that are in red that are shown uh, for resolutions are approved by the city council as the project goes forward. So they receive the report and call for a hearing on the improvement. We send out notices to the independent. We mail improvement hearing notices to everyone in the district that may be assessed for the project. We publish that in the newspaper and we also send these notices to the bus company and to the police department because both of those entities may have significant uh, coordination issues with the projects that we have. Then we do have initiated, and this is not a council requirement, a city requirement, but we have a public informational meeting. So once the project is started to be designed and developed, we want to get the input from the public on each of these projects that we're proposing. We want to know what the specifics are, uh, from the residents, from the businesses that are along the zone, so we can inform them what the intent of the project will be and what kind of input that they might have for the, the project itself, whether that's access, whether that's construction timeline. There's a lot of things that the public can help us with in the development of the project. So then we have a public hearing on the improvement. We tell the people pretty much the same thing, but we bring it forward to the city council to explain what we've told to the, the, at the public informational meetings already, and we inform them pretty much the exact same things, maybe with the public input that we got at that meeting, and tell that to council. We also then send that authorization form back to Marshall Municipal Utilities to go to the next step which is final project development and associated potential costs. Uh, the city council at this same time uh, has a resolution that would then uh, order the improvement and preparation of the plans. We, if in fact we don't have all the right of way necessary, we'll have to get the right of way for the project. Very seldom do our projects entail acquiring additional right-of-way. But it can happen if you're uh, doing something just immediately adjacent to and a little bit off the right-of-way. Uh, that's a kind of, kind of uh, instance where we might have to get some more right-of-way to purchase. So then at the next meeting we, we have with the council, there's a resolution that approves the plans and specifications and orders the advertisement for bids. So we do that, we put it in the independent, we publish it, we put it in the construction, um, uh, a construction location. We have the advertisement uh, not only uh, 
yeah, in the, in the independent here, but other publications. And then we received the bids. And we received the bids um, at a meeting that's been established in the advertisement for bids. It's not at a council meeting. We take those, we review those bids, we determine what we believe is the uh, most responsible bidder. Usually it's the low bidder, but it doesn't have to be. So we uh, bring that recommendation to the city council with the recommendation that we've had after we review it. And like I say, it, it most probably will be the low, what we call it, the low responsible bidder. And sometimes the low responsible bidder may not be the low price of the project. Then the council really does make that determination. If they want to go back to, to, to the, the low bidder, they certainly can. It's in the discussion that we have. Then after that process as well, we take it, that authorization form back to Marshall Municipal Utilities for a third time to get their concurrence that they are, understand what the potential cost might be. The bids are in. Uh, hopefully the bids that came in were a little bit less than we had thought they might be. So it's a, it's a process that we use to make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on and the potential costs of the project. Now, after that, there's different methods of bringing the assessments forward to the public. Uh, once we authorize the bidder for the project, we're pretty much tied into that, uh, to that project and project cost. But it doesn't really say who's going to pay for it. And the, the separation of the project costs are divided into several different funds and accounts and participation. So there could be participation from Marshall Municipal Utilities from the wastewater department for sewer lines, for the stormwater department for storm sewer replacement and repair. There could be a city, what's called ad valorem. It's uh, the amount of money that is committed to by the city council out of the general taxation of the city that helps pay for part of it. And then of course we have the assessment amounts. And those assessment amounts are just a portion of the project cost. And so we take that portion, we, we divide it up according to a special assessment policy that we have, and then propose that to the public. Right now, the city is going through a process of reviewing the special assessment process. There are some questions as to uh, whether or not we should be charging for certain things or other things. So there's a process going on right now that will define uh, from these projects forward. Uh, they, al they also will be discussing, you know, how much is the maximum residential assessment that we should be charging. And we have a special form for special assessments that indicates what is being special assessed uh, of the street portions, what your per, uh, participation will be, plus the other things that we uh, call completely individual assessments. Up to this point in time, it's been your driveway and your sewer service line from the main to the right-of-way line. Actually, the main to the house, but we only work up to the right-of-way line. So those things can count up in a hurry. Our maximum amount currently for street reconstruction is $5,500, not including the driveways and sewer service lines and special walk-ups and special considerations. So those kinds of things can double that assessment sometimes. So you have to keep in mind that we don't pay for 50% of everything. Now, like I said, that's being reviewed and that policy might change, but that's the current policy. So we go through the, the special assessment process. The, the council has authorized the work to be done, and now we get to start the project. So it's a lot of planning. Normally a project is on our list of things to do for five years. 
So we have to be looking out, we have to be identifying the projects that we intend to do over the next five years. Knowing that things might change, that projects might come in that are more important or uh, get slid in or we have a project that we really want to do but it has to wait because of funding sources. We have a lot of outside funding sources for our projects. We have uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. One of our key um, helpers in funding major projects in the city and adjacent to the city. I'll give you good examples of those. Uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of our projects that use transportation economic development funding from the state. That's called TED project funding. We have DEED project funding, which is the Department of uh, uh, in Environmental and uh, I can't remember what the, it's a development, an economic development. So, so we have a significant amount of money that come from the state for special projects. We also have the uh, municipal state aid account that every year part of the gas tax money comes back to all the cities over 5,000 population and we as the city of Marshall get about $750,000 a year for those types of projects and they have to be on specific routes in the city of Marshall and we have a map that shows what are the eligible state aid participation routes in town. This year Saratoga Street is one of our prime examples of where we're going to be talking about. So anyway, this is just the start of the process that gets us for the contractor to um, be under contract with the city. So now I'm going to go through the individual project examples that we have for the project. This is the project that we talked about recently that's the deed project funding. It's the Commerce Industrial Park just on the northwest side of the city of Marshall. It's about 160 acres, about a quarter section of land that the city has acquired specific, specifically for the construction of, of industrial type businesses. And the reason that they, they did that is because all of our other industrial areas were essentially full. Yes, we do have uh, some individual lots within those uh, industrial park areas that are still available, but nothing that was significant enough to be able to have a major uh, industrial developer come to the city of Marshall. So this uh, project was developed to help accomplish that. So this is kind of what we talk about as being the phasing of the industrial park project. And this, this is the uh, approximately 160 acres just on the west side of the city. This is Trunk Highway 68 that goes towards Ghent and, uh, and Minneota. And this is just on the north side of Trunk Highway 68. There's been a lot of construction work. This little purple uh, piece was a project that was the transportation and economic development project, the TED project, which was an acceleration lane and access from the industrial park to Trunk Highway 68. Uh, this is a real good location for uh, industrial development because this is County Road 33 as well that comes from uh, Trunk Highway 68 to Trunk Highway 59 and to Trunk Highway 23 on the east side of town. So there's a, there's a good connectivity for industrial uh, developers and users to, to access the main uh, routes for their product, both, both for incoming material supply and outgoing product. Uh, uh, this is the connection for Highway 68, that the reason for that is I'll give you the example that we use. It's the acceleration lane, like at the intersection of uh, County Road 33 and Trunk Highway 23. It allows 
loaded or unload large semi-traffic to be able to come onto the highway and accelerate to get up to speed with the other traffic uh, rather than pulling out on a two-lane state highway and trying to get up to speed with cars behind you. That was the sole purpose of this project, was to get that acceleration lane for heavy truck traffic up to speed on 68. The next project that you see is this blue line. That is the deed uh, roadway project that is, opens up this entire area for development. It is an extension of Michigan Road. This from here going east goes all the way to Trunk Highway 59 and continues on to be able to connect right through here. So this, what we call small development in that area, opens up a significant portion of that area. And I'm going to say at least a third of the area by putting in one street. These three green lines are future development areas that can be installed so that these areas could be developed whenever it became necessary to develop them. So it's a phased uh, project. And that could be multiple phases, maybe not just three. Maybe it's three, four, and five, depending upon what the need is for development. The next uh, slide here for the Commerce Industrial Park involves really how it's being developed. The sanitary sewer, the storm sewer, the water mains. I'll give you an example. Just to get to this area, we really had to install storm sewer lines that these are detention ponds, stormwater detention ponds. They have to, they are required for any type of development for surface water runoff in the state of Minnesota. So these are being developed. There's one here for this area of the project and one here, which is actually a larger one that has a channel that takes runoff water from these lots and conveys that to this pond that ultimately just discharges to a wetland area that goes north to, through and out of the city. So it's, it's kind of a complex <coughs> system of stormwater detention treatment for development. Uh, in order to discharge this then to the, to the uh, bypass channel, uh, there had to be stormwater piping installed all the way down to Lake Road. <coughs> the storm sewer from Lake Road uh, was already developed with another industrial park project. The water main is also been Ex will also be extended under this project and has already been done last fall by the contractor that extends this, the uh, water main up to Michigan Road and all the way back to Michigan Road here. So they've done a looping project for the development of this area and that's already installed. Uh, you can see there's quite a bit of construction for the development of the south portion, and these dashed lines are for future development projects. We'll go to the next one. This project, excuse me, is an example of our residential development projects. These two streets um, they're Marguerite and South Bend, and they are completely residential construction projects. This is the area between Country Club Drive and Southview Drive that uh, those, those roadways are probably 50 years old. 
and the materials that were used at that time, for instance, cast iron water lines. They're very undersized. They, they don't provide adequate fire protection for flows. Uh, there's limited, um, limited flows in those old pipes. And uh, the sanitary sewer is clay and is cracked and allows water to get into the sanitary sewer lines. They will all be replaced. All the street will be replaced. We'll be installing under drains on both sides of the street to make sure that we take care of all of the moisture that gets through the surface or that comes up from underneath, uh, carries that away to the storm sewer so that we don't have a saturated base uh, underneath the paving. Usually that's what creates real problems in the springtime with our freeze-thaw cycles. That, that top section uh, thaws out first and then it's frozen underneath and then you get pressure uh, from the traffic on those streets and it help, just kind of pumps the, the, uh, the top of the surface and creates uh, potholes and things like that. We're, you're probably um, experiencing some of that pothole development uh, right now as we speak. We, that, we go through that every spring and uh, the crews have just started that process for, for uh, pothole repair now. But that's an example of, of just residential redevelopment and typically it's after a very long period of time of construction. It's another thing that we want to stress that these projects may be initiated by a variety of people and entities. For instance, the public themselves can initiate them. Marshall Municipal Utilities can initiate them because of things like significant water breaks or undersized mains. Uh, there's a lot of money that's spent on maintaining the system and after 50 years it's that time. You, you couldn't probably imagine taking your house, having it 50 years old and never doing any improvements to it over that 50 years. There's just those things that you have to do periodically, the, the, crack, uh, the, the cracks that, that come up, we have to patch the holes, we have to um, do mill and overlays of that surface over time. But at some point in time, it's time to replace the whole thing. And that's what's happening in this project. The major project that we wanted to talk about tonight is the Saratoga Street Reconstruction Project. This one really entails a lot of civil engineering expertise and development. Uh, and I want to talk about that just a minute. Um, there's a lot of different types of engineering, and especially for the young students that come and listen to this. Uh, there's many different types of engineering. This is called civil engineering and hopefully we're civil all the time. But civil engineering is really for things like streets and curb and gutter and driveways and water mains and sewer mains and storm sewer mains and project development for those types of projects. That's what we're here for and that's what we're all about. It's a great field. It's a real uh, commitment of doing things that you think will make the community better in the long run. So. I want to touch, touch on that for just a minute because you're going to see here, this is a major reconstruction project in Marshall. Saratoga Street is also one of those state aid streets that we talked about that we do get uh, additional funding for uh, from the state for the reconstruction and development of, of areas within the right of way. And this project uh, starts, starts at the river on Saratoga Street right by MMU and goes southeasterly past Schwann's, past uh, the library, past the YMCA, past the middle school. So you can see how many major entities there are. And of course, we have residential development on the other side. We don't want to minimize those because they use those, that street every day, just like so many others do to get where they're going across town 
or from one area to another or utilizing the facilities. So this is a major construction project. There's also two little pieces coming off of Saratoga Street, one on vacated South First Street. Right now it's on the east side of Schwann's Corporate. That's green space, grass, uh, access for a small parking area, uh, their major access from their parking lots to the building, lots of things there, but we have water main and sewer main under that vacated street that we have to replace. The, the sewer line in this area just north of, of Schwann's Corporate used to go through the old railroad tracks. So if there's anyone that's listening that that was here when the railroad used to come through there, the original sanitary sewer lines that were underneath the tracks are still there, and they're almost completely blocked. They're cast iron lines. We can't get through them anymore with our cleaners. So it's time to replace them. And it's been long overdue to replace them, but we've been getting by and getting by and getting by, and now it's the time to replace it, along with the water mains they're in the area as well. Uh, this is a piece of 8, 8A Street that also needs replacement for the sanitary sewer line. So uh, that will be uh, reconstructed as well. And that is at the entrance areas to uh, the YMCA, uh, but they do have access off Marvin Schwan Drive. Uh, so uh, there will be some discussion here about access during that time. And the fire hall is there too. So we're, we have to make arrangements during construction for accessibility. So that's kind of the, from the, the summary of the project. From about um, C Street on, this is kind of a minor, we're not going to be digging up the entire street. So that one will be like a mill and overlay project with some repairs to other things, but that will be uh, significantly less uh, uh, dig ups than the rest of it. So, and we've had our public informational meetings, we've met with the property owners along there, uh, and so that uh, is being called for bids now. Uh, one thing that we do also in the development of the project, we do what's called a one call. It asks for all the public utilities to come forward, actually anyone that has anything within the right of way, to come and identify what they have and where they have it. So when they identify those spots, then we mark all of those and we put all of them on the plans, whether that's a gas line, a Verizon line, a CenturyLink line, and in the case we have some private installations too, like um, sprinkler systems or uh, private mailboxes or uh, flower gardens or we have <coughs> several things that kind of seem to crop up over time in your front yard that are on public right of way that we really need to know about. So uh, what we do is we identify what we're going to reconstruct and what things might be in the way of doing that. Uh, so the, either the utilities have to relocate those, their, their facilities or pay us to pay the contractor to relocate them or have the property owner relocate them. So I know they're hard to see on here, but the, the uh, different colored lines identify different types of utilities, whether that's power, water, sewer, storm sewer. Uh, we also have this area along the school that we're intending to do some, I think it, it, it seems fairly minor, but it might have significant impacts to the adjacent area. For instance, there's a short chain link fence there that's on the right of way that we want relocated. So that's going to be a part of the project cost. Uh, we'll have driveway replacements all along there. 
Uh, we check with everybody about the access locations. We check with the residents about, do you want to widen your driveway? Do you want to narrow your driveway? Do you want to get rid of a sidewalk walk up? There's, th those are the kinds of things that we address in that project as well. Um, so this is, the, this is the total project area. We've kind of already shown that. This is, I'm going to show you a few of these pictures. And I know there, you know, there's a lot of stuff on these pictures. And this is what the contractor has to look at when he bids the project and finds out from each page. And in this case, there's over 50 pages of, of plans like this. And every section, this is starting at the, at the Redwood River. And this, this shows the, the, new, uh, uh, the, the new sewer lines that are going in. It shows the water lines here. The blue lines are the water lines. The green lines are the sanitary sewer lines. So there's lots of stuff that's underground. And this is something that Paul had asked me to put together is really what's all in the street and under the street. All of those things are under the street, including power, water, sewer, storm, um, cable TV, gas, all that stuff is under the street. So when you start digging things up, you better know where those things are because you don't want to hit a gas line with your backhoe. You don't want to dig up your fiber optic line that runs through there or heaven forbid your cable TV. But those are, those are really important items not to, not to disturb. And, and it does happen. We don't like it to happen, but sometimes it does happen. But these are the kinds of things. And on the bottom part in this grid area, this shows all of the underground things that we are replacing. It shows the, the water main, what type and size it is. It shows the depth of the manholes on the sanitary sewer line. It shows, you can see that this line is running downhill. This, because it's sanitary sewer, it has to go downhill unless you're pumping it. So you can see how this is the most shallow manhole on this page. And then this one is deeper because the street is higher and the bottom has to be lower. So we have to identify the exact distance of height of those structures that have to be purchased and bid. So that's what this section is for. It shows the existing center line elevation of the roadway, and it shows the future, the new elevation of the roadway. So that we can say, is it going up or down on the uh, attached driveways? What do we have to do with them to coordinate with the existing grades and new proposed grades? Every sheet is done that way throughout the whole section. You can see underground, how many feet deep it is. These are the elevations on the left-hand side. And all of the elevations are shown. And uh, so the contractor knows at each individual spot how deep they are. And these locations correspond with the plan locations up above. And it looks like there's conflict when you look at just the bottom, but if you look at the top, they're 10 feet apart. They might be at the same elevation. So those are the kinds of things that our design staff at the city office does all of these um, plans. Now I'll give you an example. This is the fire station. This is the fire station, and there's a fairly sharp curve located just east of the fire station. And very few people ever drive on this piece of pavement out here because they're cutting the corner. And they're maybe going a little faster than they should be. But anyway, that, that portion is seldom used. 
So why should we pay for its replacement? We've actually moved the, the curve over about 10 feet here, and we didn't have to move it as far on the other side because it's wider at that location. We can make this curve a lot easier to maneuver and have more of the pavement used for driving on. Now, there was some conversation in our informational meetings concerning, you know, if you make that too nice a curve, people are going to speed more than they do today. Now, there might be some truth to that in that you maybe won't have to break as much coming into that curve, but maybe if it's a consistent speed going through there, you don't have to slow down and speed up either. Uh, we will be addressing that safety uh, issue. Um, this, let, me, let me go forward here just a little bit more. Okay, this is when you go around the curve and heading south, here's the library right here. And so as you're going south, we have a future project that's being coordinated with, with MnDOT now that's going to, we're proposing to install special crosswalk devices at the crosswalks going across uh, Saratoga Street. And those are going to include two things. One is push button signals that will light up the sign when a pedestrian wants to cross. And so it will bring it to their attention. The other thing is that we've asked for is radar uh, speed signs. So we have a, a, a regulatory speed sign, let's say it's 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour. Then there'll be a panel under that that says your speed. I'm sure you've seen those at other locations. But this is the speed limit. This is your speed. And then it will say something like when flashing. So we intend to have those only operational when school is in session or there's a certain event that the school manages those, those signs that says this is when we have school. This is when we want you to reduce your speed. Because many times in school zones that are there 24-7, every day of the year, people disregard them. <coughs> so we would like to be able to inform people that it's important that you pay attention to these speed limits in this school zone. And this is a time you need to pay atten more attention. Not that you shouldn't be paying attention all the time and following the speed limits all the time, but it's not just going to be a school zone sign that's there every day, every year. Okay, so that's our intent. We want to make these areas as safe as possible and still accommodate traffic flow through the area. Uh, these other pictures were just further examples of different utilities that were being replaced uh, on the project. This is another thing that a lot of people are very interested in. What is our special assessment process? Uh, process? What is it going to cost me for this project? And that we, we go through every year, both at the beginning of the project, this is our special assessment process. And like I said, uh, it's, it's fairly comprehensive, but we want to make sure everybody knows how it affects them. And so for each project, whether it be a residential project, a state aid project, an industrial park project, we have a policy that we use for special assessments. Uh, I think that it's important that people not only understand that there is a process that we use, but to be able to come to our meetings and 
ask their questions and get responses. And you know, sometimes we don't all agree to the, the amount that we're getting. We want to make sure that we are transparent in showing you how we come up with that number. And we have a very large spreadsheet that shows how much it is for the street, for sanitary sewer, for storm sewer, for any of those uh, amenities that are placed on the, on the project. We want to, you to know what that sum of special assessments is all about. And like I said before, the council is just now going through a review of what this special assessment process. And it, they will come forward with either the same or some changes to that special assessment process. So that's, that's how we come forward with it. It's all based upon the work that's being done. Someone has to pay for it. Most of the time, it's the utility companies. Uh, and of course, it's never free for anyone. Okay, so the portion that MMU pays comes out of your water bill. The portion that wastewater pays comes out of your sewer bill. But it, that is spread over the entire city, those kinds of payments. The, the assessment for the storm sewer work is, comes out of the surface water utility that you pay for on, on, your, on your utility bill as well. The only time we have special assessments for storm water for a reconstruction project, if there's something new, if the property owner wants a storm sewer run from his backyard all the way to the front, they've got to pay for that. And we don't typically include that in our project cost. Anything new, a new construction area, that's paid for by the initial developer. But the reconstruction and repair is paid for from the surface water fund for that case. So kind of as a summary, we, uh, we really enjoy the work that we do and hopefully there are projects that are, are necessary and that we have been planning for some time and the costs are reasonable and we have contractors that can do a good job uh, on the project and they're the low responsible bidder. That's the other thing. That's, that's how we have to work is we can't pick and choose who we work with as long as they're responsible for getting the work done. Uh, we have had some you know, complaints about certain work that you know, contractors have done, but we really do try to minimize those conflicts. And number two, uh, take care of those conflicts before the project is closed out. Sometimes with any construction project, you have to come back a year later or maybe even a little longer than a year, to repair some things like when you're digging eight to 20 feet in the ground, there's gonna be some settlement of that trench over the next one to five years. Hopefully the initial settlement of those trenches is within the first year when the contractor has to come back and do some repair work. That doesn't, that's not always the case, but that's what we count on is anything that's really uh, an, an issue within the year, first year or two, we can, we can address. After that, it's kind of a maintenance issue. So, uh, we enjoy our work. We really enjoy working with the public on the projects. We believe that when we're done with the design and the public informational meetings, we have the best project design development that we can. And uh, this summer, you're going to see a lot of that. You know, sometimes people say, you know, we have a back hole in every corner. Well, it's not really that many, but we do have significant projects this year. You've seen three major ones. We also have MnDOT that's doing their projects. We just had an informational meeting with MnDOT on the, re uh, the repair of two of our bridges leading into downtown one at the Freedom Gas Station location, the other just west of town on Highway 68. So those two are gonna be going on at the same time these projects are going on. 
We're going to have MnDOT doing a J-turn project, a safety improvement project out at Trunk Highway 23 and the intersection with the Lion Street. That will be a major construction project in town, even though it's their jurisdiction. Um, next year, they plan on doing something with County Road 7 and Trunk Highway 23 as another safety improvement project. Safety is number one on all of our construction related issues. That kind of drives projects. When you have si significant and severe accidents, that drives projects. We don't like to see those. We do whatever we can to help take care of those. The other things are is just deterioration of infrastructure over time. 50 years is a long time to have pipes in the ground. So that's kind of our major, major uh, project development process that we have. So that's, that's all we have for you. Any questions that you might have? If anyone in the public has questions about any of these projects or other projects in general, or how to start a project, uh, just come to City Hall or give us a call or email us. Our information is on our website and we'd be pleased to meet with anyone concerning them. Thank you. Thank you. I have some, do you have some questions? Are you going to ask about that? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, well, I was wondering, um, you were showing the plans with all the various um, sewer lines and mm -hmm. other lines. Um, you're, the contractors are using those to bid on the project. Uh -huh. Would you? have to be a civil engineer to understand that and know how much you're going to bid for the various projects looking at those? Is that what a civil engineer would be doing? Civil engineers do that, but there are also a lot of really good project estimators. Okay. They look at a set of plans like this and there's a, a, a at the beginning of the project there's a list of all of the things that we're bidding mm -hmm. and how many feet so for instance, it might be 2,000 feet of eight inch water main. And it's got to meet a certain specification, like PVC, class 900. Yep. They can get that out of their supplier's book and then they have to call and get supply information on that. Okay, okay but on every single bid item, they have to understand what's involved with that item. So there are things that are incidental to, to certain bid items. So if you're going to bid the water main, it might include the, the film, the gravel that's going around it. So you've got to take all of those items into account. That's another reason why in the development of the project, we want to make sure that we're fairly consistent in what we do from year to year. We might not be the same as Worthington or Mankato for what's included on that bid item. But we should be consistent in Marshall on how, what we expect of the contractor for that bid item. And we, we try to be consistent throughout on each of our items. Now, if in fact, there's something we want to bring to their attention because it's a little different than what we've done before or a different material, we put those in what's called special provisions. It's a special section that's not our spec book. It's saying, this is what we want for that item. Okay? And, and we bring that to their attention so that they know that that's a little bit different than most. We have so, another good example is when we changed from manholes that had steps in them to manholes that don't have steps in them, even though they're very deep. And why did we do that? We do that because of safety only. We don't want people to be climbing down into that manhole without an apparatus that takes that person and puts them down that hole. Because then there has to be somebody with them, doesn't there? And we've had conditions where those manhole steps have broken off. After many years, they, they corrode. And so we've had instances where those have broken off when people have tried to go down them. 
So for instance, that's a good example of safety generated specifications that we don't allow them in any manhole in Marshall anymore. You have to have an apparatus that lowers you into the manhole and brings you back up again. So somebody else is going to have to be there with you. That is a job I would not want to do. It's kind of confining, isn't it? It's, it's very confining. And you have to understand that there can be bad things down in those manholes. Yeah. yeah. What's the deepest one we have? No? 30 feet, probably. Okay. It's really deep. And in those cases, too, we have to evacuate the air. We have to have air pumping facilities that pump air down there. And, uh, and of course, somebody monitoring that the whole time so that if something happens to the person, you can't go down and get them. You know, and they can't climb back out. Somebody has to be out, up there to, to take them out of that condition. So we, we do have, we do have a gauge monitoring that says what the quality of the air is down there before we do anything. There's so many safety things that are required and we want to do for, for those types of operations. So, yep, safety is number one. That's why you see some of our utilities that have cones on the trucks that are required to put the cone behind the truck whenever they get out because the employer wants them to watch what they're backing into. Because sure. you may not be able to see something that's behind the truck if you just walk in from the front and, and want to back up. So those, there, there's certain safety things that are, have become just automatics now. There, there, there will be detours in town. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have detours for each of our projects at some point in time. Uh, so will MnDOT for their bridge repairs. They handed out um, information concerning where those, uh, where those detours are. And their project is intended, weather permitting, to start on April 23rd. So that's right around the corner. Uh, you know, time slips away, and uh, and a project that we thought, well, yeah, we're having one now. All of a sudden, it's the end of April. So, what are some of the things you consider when you're planning a detour? Mostly, what type of traffic is going to be using that detour? So, for instance, all of the state highways must have detours that have 10-ton load limits. So, they have to be able to take semi-traffic. We have to understand too that all of the heavy traffic and all of the car traffic won't be taking that detour. They're going to have a delivery that's uptown and our detour is on the perimeter and the state highways around town or on county roads. So there's going to be traffic that may be diverted from their normal route to get somewhere. I'll give you an example. If truck traffic needs to come downtown, they're probably going to come down College Drive and turn on 3rd Street and come down 3rd Street and turn on Marshall Street or some other, because they're, they're going to a destination downtown. That's all they can do. Or you might be going from your home to a certain location and you, you know that there's a detour set up, but that's not the way you're going because I'm not bypassing the city. I'm not going through the city. I'm going to a spot that I know where I'm going to go. So I'm not going to take my normal route, but it's not going to be on a detour either. It's going to be, I have to figure out what's best for me to get from where I am to where I'm going. And we want you to do that. Don't follow a detour just because it says detour. Make sure that you understand what's going on in that area. You'll find out fairly soon um, w where you can go and where you can't. And I don't care if that's a delivery truck or you going to the grocery store. So yes, there will be detours for uh, Saratoga Street. We'll probably break it into two sections. Detour one area when we're working on one part. Detour the other area when we get that part done and we we go to the go to the south part, for instance. But yep, there. 
you have to just be a little patient. That's another thing that we're kind of short of sometimes is I'm kind of, I'm behind schedule. And now the street's blocked. So keep track of what's going on before it happens. We'll be giving regular information to the public uh, on everything that we're doing. So hopefully kind of keep up on, on the news and, and our website and things like that. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Thank All right, you thank so you. Much. Yeah. <laughs>